Okay, I'm ready. Good afternoon. The Week Fish Board will now come to order. Um, I'm John Clark from Delaware. I'll be chairing the board today. I'd like to second Marty's eloquent uh, thanks to New Hampshire and uh, the Commission for putting together this great annual meeting here at this beautiful spot. If only we can get some sunshine, it would really be fantastic. Um, first order of business is the agenda. Are there any changes or objections to the agenda? Seeing none, we will take it as approved. Uh, the proceedings from the February 2018 board meeting. Are there any changes or objections to that? Seeing none, we will accept those as approved. Uh, item number three, public comment. Nobody has signed up from the public and do not see anybody that wishes to speak. So we will now move on to item number four, which is the 2019 stock assessment update. And I'll turn that over to Aaron to from the technical committee to brief us on that. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so I'm gonna be presenting the latest results of our weak fish uh, stock assessment update. And I just wanna take a minute to thank um, everybody on the technical committee who contributed to this, um, Mike and Katie, as well as Yan Zhao, who um, was the modeler for the 2016 benchmark and ran the models again for this assessment update. Oops. So um, just basic background, uh, the weak fish Cenocean regalis is a member of the cyanid, the drum family. Uh, they range from Massachusetts to Florida, primarily, however, they're most abundantly found from New York to North Carolina. There's a well-documented hybridization zone, first documented in northern Florida um, by Trangali, um, first with Cenocean arenarius, the sand sea trout. Um, however, there have been um, hybridization documented uh, with both the um, spotted sea trout and the silver sea trout um, farther north along the range. They have a protracted spawning season from March to September, depending on where they are latitudinally. 97% uh, of weak fish are mature by age one, and they exhibit a northerly inshore migration pattern during warmer months and southerly offshore migration pattern in colder months. So the data that we looked at for this assessment included three new years since the last benchmark. So the 2016 benchmark assessment, um, the terminal year was 2014. So we added 2015 through 2017. Um, we included all the same indices that were included in the 2016 benchmark assessment, both fishery dependent and independent indices. Um, the biggest change in this assessment update was this new um, MRIP calibration, which I'll speak to in a moment. Um, and all of the ecological reference points were updated um, with this assessment update. So uh, MRIP, historically, um, effort estimates were derived from the Coastal Household Telephone Survey. Um, there were issues with that, um, non-reporting, um, people just not picking up their phones. Um, so um, the survey uh, effort is now called the Fishing Effort Survey, um, and it's mail-based um, in order to um, fix some of those issues. So for three years, these surveys were um, concurrently held uh, so that a calibration index could be developed. Um, in 2018, this effort survey switched completely to this mail-based fishing effort survey. Um, the mail-based survey, the fishing effort survey, gives us much higher estimates of effort, and that translates into higher catch estimates as well. In 2013, uh, there were improvements made to the um, Access Point Angler Intercept Survey. Um, this survey um, is how we derive recreational catch per unit effort, as well as length frequencies of the recreational catch. Um, these data were um, combined, and uh, the MRIP survey was calibrated back um, all the way through the historical timeline. So if we look at um, recreational catch, both the harvest and uh, live release uh, pro proportion of the fishery, um, we can see in the, the yellow, we have um, the uncalibrated survey. Um, in the blue, we have the survey that's just calibrated with the, um, that access point angler intercept survey, and you can see there's very little difference between um, either the harvest or the live releases. Um, however, when we look at the newly calibrated MRIP with these new estimates, estimates of effort, 
we're seeing um, much higher estimates of both our harvest and our live releases in the recreational fishery. If we look at coastwide percent differences between the calibrated and uncalibrated surveys, um, we're seeing about a 72% increase um, across the harvest um, along the whole uh, timeline of the survey. And in live releases, we're seeing about 97% increase. Um, however, if you focus primarily on the most recent years, you can see that um, that these percent uh, differences are much higher, anywhere between sometimes 150% to 300% greater. So the commercial landings of weak fish um, peaked in the, the early to mid 80s and we've seen a decline in commercial landings ever since then, um, plateauing since about two, 2003 and, and remaining low. And then similarly with commercial discards um, peaking in the early to mid 90s and, um, and they have remained low in the recent years. So if we look at total fishery removals combining both the commercial and recreational catch, um, we can see again since 1982 um, where we were seeing the, the highest levels um, of removals from the fisheries um, and in the most recent years um, that uh, those fishery removals have decreased significantly. If we look at um, this smaller portion since 2003, a little bit difficult to discern in this graph here, um, just blowing it up, we can see that the total removals during this period have remained low, but what we are seeing is that the proportion of um, discards, commercial and recreational, um, are increasing. So uh, commercial discards are considered 100% mortality. Um, any weak fish released alive as um, a part of the recreational survey were assuming a 10% mortality rate. So we developed um, catch at age for uh, the fisheries. Um, first thing we did was uh, developed age length keys and we did this by year, season, and region. Um, so we did this for the uh, three latest years um, of the, the updated survey, so from 2015 to 2017. Um, we had an early and a late season and just two regions, north and south, for a total of 12 age length keys. And then we had length frequency data, um, and those were um, assessed by year, season, region, and then we included the fishery component, commercial versus recreational, as well as disposition, so harvest versus discard. And all of these were combined to look at uh, catch at age matrices um, annually by fishery. So commercial length frequencies um, were taken from uh, state samples, so um, state trip ticket reporting systems, as well as uh, National Marine Fisheries Service um, samples. We had a uh, South region, um, only North Carolina provided length data, even though Florida did report commercial catch, um, there were no lengths associated, and then again, we have those um, hybridization issues. Um, Georgia and South Carolina, neither one of those states um, have any commercial fishery for weak fish. Um, the north regions were broken into um, three subregions based on the minimum allowable commercial catch size. And uh, discards were reported through the Northeast Fishery Observer Program data. And recreational length frequencies came again from that MRIP um, Access Point Angler Intercept Survey. Uh, as far as the live releases since 2004, there's been a headboat observer program. So uh, discard lengths were derived from those data. Um, there's a gap between 2000 and 2003 um, where there were no observer data. Um, so we pulled 2004 to 2008 and then um, applied those to that, that little gap period. And from 1982 to 1999, the discards were assumed to be um, same length frequencies as the harvest um, due to no regulatory discards. So if we look at um, this graph here, so at the top of the y-axis um, beginning in 1982 to the most recent year of this assessment update in 2017, we can see that both in the commercial and recreational fishery um, across all ages, so from young of year to age six, um, we're seeing a, a depletion in um, the catch amongst all of the ages. 
So this is a, a list of the indices of abundance that we used in the update. These are the same that were used in the 2016 benchmark assessment. Um, these you can find in more detail in your report. Um, mostly fishery independent surveys with the exception of that um, emirate harvest per unit effort survey. So on to our model results. Um, all of the same models that were investigated in the 2000 benchmark assessment were considered um, in this update. Um, however, we uh, ended up using the Bayesian statistical catch at age model. Um, and the model that performed best included a time varying natural mortality component as well as spatial heterogeneity. We only used ages one through uh, six plus in the model and we had two fleets considered uh, commercial and recreational. So as a result of the change in the, the effort estimates um, through the new MRIP survey, um, the base run of this model included that new MRIP calibration, but there was a sensitivity run performed with the old uncalibrated MRIP data set to see how they performed against one another. So if we look at um, the fishery, fishery mortality um, as a result of the commercial um, fishery in the yellow. Um, so that includes all of the data through 2017 with this latest um, assessment update, um, but with the old MRIT estimation of effort. Um, the blue is our benchmark assessment trend line, and in the black, that's um, the latest version of the, the MRIP estimation of effort um, through 2017 data. So that we can see um, with the old MRIP uh, effort estimate is where we see the, the highest um, fishing mortality due to com the commercial fishery. However, when we apply the new MRIP data and look at the recreational component of fishing mortality, we're actually seeing that flipped. So we're seeing a higher um, proportion of that um, total fishery mortality coming from uh, the recreational fishery. Um, so when we look at the, the natural mortality um, in this model run, we're not seeing much of a difference compared to the 2016 benchmark. Natural mortality is remaining high. Uh, total abundance um, is still remaining low. Um, really not much difference between the um, new NRIP estimation and the uh, old uncalibrated survey. And we see that same trend in recruitment. So the status of the stock, um, we have a spawning, spawning stock biomass threshold that was defined in the 2016 benchmark assessment at around 6,800 metric tons, and that was redefined with this update um, at around 6,200 metric tons. Um, so if you see that, that dark gray solid line, that's the, the um, 6,200 metric ton <laughs> threshold. And you can see that um, we have been well below that. We continue to remain um, well below that threshold level of spawning stock biomass. And if we look at the um, total mortality, um, we do have a threshold limit of total mortality as well as a target. So again, that solid gray line is our threshold total mortality. So you can see that in 2017, um, we're actually approaching the threshold level, um, but we're still well above that target level of total mortality. <coughs> So our stock status, currently we're depleted. Again, um, that spawning stock biomass. So that's 30% um, of the adult stock and unfished stock under um, constant natural mortality, uh, mean natural mortality. So um, the stock is still depleted and that total mortality value, we're still exceeding um, that threshold level. Um, although you can see that the 2017 value is 1.45 and our threshold level is now defined at 1.43. So just above that threshold level. Um, and our fishing um, uh, estimates reference points are actually not biologically applicable at this time because we're so far below that spawning stock biomass threshold. So these research recommendations, um, these are, are really um, 
summarized kind of succinctly compared to uh, what's in your report. Um, but again, increasing the observer coverage could be really beneficial, especially in helping us um, better define uh, discards. Um, investigating models that incorporate weak fish predation as well as weak fish diets could be really useful in helping us explain this um, high natural mortality component. Um, looking at the spawner recruit relationship and especially the relationships between um, adult stock size, environmental factors, um, and year class strength. Um, developing a coastwide tagging program could be useful, uh, especially looking at um, migration and interaction between northern and southern regions. Um, it would be useful to continue looking at this hybridization issue uh, along the range of weak fish. And um, the last two research recommendations in particular um, are speaking to the model. So um, in the next benchmark, looking at not only time varying natural mortality, um, but age varying natural mortality, as well as incorporating uh, those young of year fish into the model. Thank you very much, Aaron. Uh, that news is not surprising, but it's still depressing. Uh, let me open up the floor to questions. Anybody questions for Aaron? Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and thank you very much. So my question is about you want to increase or you're recommending increased observer coverage. <coughs> What exactly does that mean? I mean, I can't imagine there's that many directed trips on weak fish. So are you looking at, what are you trying to look at in that, that recommendation? Thanks, so we're looking, so this covers, this would cover number one, the shrimp trawl, um, fleet, so we're interested in weak fish being a, has the potential to be a significant component of weak, tr of shrimp trawl bycatch, so we'd like to get more data on that component, as well as, yes, there is no directed fishery for weak fish, but I think there's been a concern that weak fish may be, because there's, they're not allowed to be kept, that they're just being thrown, thrown back and we're not seeing that mortality, especially south of Cape Hatteras, which the Northeast Fishery Observer Program does not cover. And so, um, We've seen a little bit of increased discarding in the most recent couple of years, but because the sample size is so low, there's a lot of uncertainty about that. So we would just like better data on how much mortality is coming from these fish that are being thrown back that we're not seeing. Thanks. Okay, I'm going to go around the table. Next we have Emerson Hasbrook. Thank you, Mr. So that's a good question. Um, so if we look at the um, component of fishing mortality um, and we break it down into commercial and recreational, what we're seeing is as a re result of that MRP calibration where we're seeing these much higher estimates of, um, of effort that's translating into higher estimates of catch on the recreational side is that we're seeing um, now what was formerly attributed as a um, as fishing mortality attributed to the commercial side it, that's actually being captured now on the recreational side. So the total fishing mortality hasn't really changed over the most recent uh, years of, of the, the survey, but it's just the proportion is switching more towards recreational. Is that, did I explain that okay? Thanks. Joe, did both you and Tom have your hands up? Okay, let's start with Joe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Aaron. Great job to... Uh, Everyone, Aaron, when I was in your place, uh, I used to show um, all the Young of the Year surveys, and my old boss, Rob O'Reilly, would always question why the heck I'm showing that, since <laughs> there seemed to be absolutely no patterns or trends, other than for a while, even while the stock was depleted, we saw at least that the Young of the Year were holding steady. So I didn't really see a focus on that here. I was curious. 
are there any, uh, since there are so many surveys that are tracking this species that, that are looking better than others, um, that, that's my first question. And then if I can, just a brief follow-up after that, thanks. So specific to the young of the year indexes, um, so there have, I think in the most recent years, there have been slight upticks in some of the indices, but there are no patterns. And that's actually, so I, I actually, it is in the report, um, each of the individual indices. Um, but yeah, it's, there aren't really any patterns to follow there. And so um, I purposely left that out in terms of <laughs> the, only because um, in terms of conclusion, it, it's, it's pretty hard to wrap up in a 20 minute presentation. Well, thank you. Rob would be proud. Um, and I think we really have Rob to thank also, who is very instrumental in, in getting this model uh, to happen. Um, my other question is, is on the hybridization, uh, are you aware of work that may be going uh, forward looking at Georgia, South Carolina, Florida? I was always concerned that if, if we weren't looking at that at some regular time period, a five or ten year period, that you know, we, we wouldn't know where, what was happening there. Uh, so I did inquire about that with our genetics group because I know that they had been collecting samples, but when I checked back in with them, they looked and they hadn't uh, collected any samples in, in 2018. So um, it was my understanding that um, as recently as 2017, they had collected samples um, not only from CMAP, but also from um, the NEMAP survey. I'm not sure about CHESMAP, but I know that they had reached out um, to other states who had fishery independent um, surveys um, and they were requesting some of those samples. I think part of it is that um, there's no directed funding, so they're happy to collect um, and hold and catalog samples often. Um, there was a graduate student that, that worked on that a bit, and so when I referenced um, the hybrids, especially between um, nebulosis and nothus, as well as arenarius, um, that, that was from some of, of her work that went through, um, I think her work went through 2015 samples. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Next, we have Tom Fody. We always hold up striped bass as the star of the uh, Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, but actually the most important fish in the Marine fish Atlantic States Marine Fisheries is weak fish, and the most humbling also. I mean, and John Clark knows what I'm talking about, Roy Miller, because there would be no Atlantic Coast Conservation Act without weak fish. And it really was the driving force, and it was then Congressman Carper, now Senator Carper, and former Governor Carper, that actually basically incorporated all, all this to basically get us the Atlantic Coast Conservation Act. So it was because of weak fish. It is also the most humbling, so this is one of the fisheries that I think we did everything right. And, and it, we basically, basically got rid of a, a six-inch harvest f of the fish. We got rid of... A, the dragger fishery, because it was using, being used as catfish. Uh, Bill Hogarth put important things in to basically reduce the bycatch. Also took away the fact that you could use trash fish for bait for other things. They could basically, boats could turn it in. So we did everything right, and the weak fish start coming up, and we're saying, we're doing a great job. And the humbling part was to say, they spit at us. And they went the other direction. I have, I have no reason understanding why. I think I know why. And every time I see, and this is where we get the natural mortality, every time I see a, a blitz going on of whether weak fish, whether, I mean, whether it's bluefish or striped bass and everything, and all of a sudden I stop pulling the bluefish, and I see, what's that strange tail he's spitting out? That's not Atlantic herring or a herring. And then I realize when I put the two head and the tail together, it's weak fish. And it really is, they just devour the heck out of it, whether it's bluefish or striped bass. My concern, my question, is, I had to say that, but my question is, when I'm looking at these MRAP figures, I realize that because the catch is so low, and that's the one thing I'm missing in this, is what our catch was in, back in the 90s, because we're only looking at 2009, so we're looking at thoroughly a collapsed fishery, when the numbers were all the way up here in certain periods of time. So it doesn't require much difference of the ma uh, numbers, I, in my estimation, to go from a 70% variable to a 40, I mean, it could be a couple of thousand fish, am I right or wrong? Yeah, basically, 
those increased MRIP numbers, 200, 300 percent, is on a very small amount of removals. So you don't, you can, the trend is exactly the same, really high and really low. It hasn't miraculously made more weak fish to catch. Thanks. Uh, next question we have is from Chris Batsavage. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Aaron, for the, uh, the presentation. Um, part of my question was uh, answered with, with Joe asking about uh, trends in juvenile abundance indices. Um, looking at the uh, commercial discards uh, that were somewhat higher in the most recent years, I was wondering if, if the discards, uh, the increase in commercial discards coincided with any increasing trends in survey abundance uh, estimates, the adult ones, for instance, or could this be a result of the lower estimates of natural mortality in the last few years. That might be a hard one to answer, but just kind of saw where there may be fewer fish dying of natural causes that are potentially being discarded that we didn't see several years ago. So any, any information on that would be appreciated. Thanks. Um, Chris, I did look at actually some of our, our CMAP data, and we did see, um, we did have some higher catches, higher than normal catches, especially in 2015. Um, but again, there's, there's a lot of error associated with that because if we look at um, the CPUE from that year, and I think in particular it was in the fall when Young of Year would have been represented, um, it, it was just from a very select few um, trawls that then inflated. So again, it, it's still kind of difficult to say whether, whether those are, you know, accurately reflected. Follow up, Chris? Yeah, so um, I, again, this might be a speculative part of my question was, uh, you know, is there a chance that with natural mortality decreasing that it could be resulted in more commercial discards, just more fish available uh, to be caught and discarded than we may have seen in previous years with higher natural mortality? I mean, so that's, that's one possibility. The other thing that we didn't talk about a lot in this presentation, but it's a little more in the report, is that we're not super confident about that decrease in natural mortality in the last couple of years. Like, if you look at the assessment update, it said the exact same thing. Of, oh, it's coming down in recent years. And, but you look at the benchmark, it was also saying, oh, we're coming down. And now you look at it, we're back up. So there may be a retrospective pattern of the model isn't seeing those year classes come in and then die off super fast, so it sees them come in, and the most recent couple of years, and it's like, everything's great, natural mortality's coming down, and then as we add a few more years of data, and we see those year classes decrease faster than they should, the model comes back and says, whoops, I was wrong, it's actually still up here. So, the, which is why I think when we did the benchmark, we wanted to come back and do an update in a couple of years to say, is this declining trend real, or is it retrospective pattern? And right now, it looks more like a retrospective pattern. So we're seeing the same thing again, um, and that's part of, I think, why Yan Zhao recommended that we do some age-specific modeling for the um, next benchmark to get maybe get around that problem issue, especially if that's highest on the younger age classes. But um, it's possible there's more of them for discards, but maybe, maybe not. Thanks. I have Roy Miller, then Lynn Fegley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Aaron. Uh, I was wondering if I could um, go back to a, a point that Katie made, if I may, to get some additional clarification. Uh, I think you said something to the effect that um, the bycatch mortality in the southern portion of the range may be problematic. If I've stated that accurately, I, uh, is there evidence of migration to the mid-Atlantic from those weak fish that occupy the southern portion of the range? By southern portion, I presume you mean below Hatteras. Is there, is there evidence to indicate migration that far north? And, and if so, um, is there another mechanism uh, um, governing the high Z rates for the stocks that occupy the mid-Atlantic to the northern part of the range of the weak fish? Thank you. Sure. So, yes, the, um, the first part of the question, below Cape Hatteras, the southern region, there is, n there is no observer coverage from the Northeast Fishery Observer Program, and there really isn't a comparable um, program 
over that region. So the, the discard <laughs> estimates are limited spatially. Um, we, do, we do see migration, um, and there's genetic evidence that they're just a single stock that's kind of moving and hanging out together. So um, they are vulnerable to fisheries down there. They're vulnerable to the same fish are vulnerable to fisheries further north. So there, it is a mixing population. Um, and in terms of what's causing the high z total mortality rate, I think um, this model doesn't tell us. We don't really know for sure. Some of the work, recent work by Jacob Krauss out of NC State University has suggested that it's pr predation mortality. Um, and he specifically called out um, bottlenose dolphin as one of the major potential predators. Um, but we could also be, you know, there's also unexplained mortality from the shrimp t t trawl fishery that we're not capturing with our data, unexplained discard mortality that's not being observed and put into this model as another potential total mortality source. But um, there's, there's a lot going on. Lynn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I'm just, I've kind of, a, and thank you, Aaron, for the presentation. So I, I, as a manager, I'm just trying to sort out, you know, we have, we manage under, Z under total mortality and we're above that and then we know that our natural mortality you know continues to skyrocket and our F appears to be just kind of waffling around um, so really my question is what is, I'm assuming that the that F level is a pretty low proportion of the Z I'm just trying to understand you know what the what the proportion of fishing mortality to total mortality is so that I mean is there anything that could even be done by controlling F at this point? Um, there really isn't, and because our spawning stock biomass is still so far below that threshold level, um, really, um, there's, there's really nothing that, that can be significantly done, done with that. In fact, leaving that alone is helping to protect the stock. Hopefully, we'll see increases in spawning stock biomass and just <laughs> Thanks. Any other questions from the board? Okay. Uh, I, I see Tom. Yeah, since I made the motion, uh, I don't know, about 10 years ago or whatever, that we basically go from one, fi one week fish for recreational and a 100 pound bycatch. And basically, so I wanted, I did that so at least we have some biological data. And should we stay there? Because I, I, without that, we don't really have any catch data at all. And we can't see whether the size or and will it do any good if we actually went to zero and zero. So that's that's well, the question. Hey, right. Tom, that's the next uh, item on the agenda is to move to. Well, I was asking to, the technical. Right. Did you have any other question, questions? Oh, I'm sorry. I just wanted to follow up on. Uh, I had a question myself about the assessment, so I should have made that clear. Sorry. <laughs> Did you have another question about the assessment? Okay. Um, I was just following up on the whole natural mortality point. Katie, you just mentioned Jacob Krause's work. Uh, bottlenose dolphin, of course, was the number one predator he found on those, and we can't do anything about that. But number two was striped bass at 21% of the mortality. And uh, you mentioned yesterday with Menhaden, when we start getting into the assessments, looking at multiple species, uh, that will obviously be a lot more uh, controversial, I think, if we started talking about limiting the size of the striped bass stock to allow us to have a larger stock of weak fish. But those are the type of relationships I presume we want to look at going forward. Yes, not, not to divert us too far from into Menhaden territory, but um, when we get into ecological reference points, it's not just about the prey, it's also about the predators and their interactions. And we do include weak fish as both a predator and a prey species in our ecological modeling, um, so that we recognize that striped bass are feeding on juvenile weak fish, um, and that uh, and bluefish gets in there too. It's a very complicated system, and so it's not just a matter of stop fishing on Menhaden and everything's great, these predators also have their own interactions independent of Menhaden as well. Thank you. Um, oh, we, do you have a question about the assessment, Arnold? Okay, uh, please come to the public mic. Uh, yeah. Um, I'm Arnold Leo. Uh, represent the fishing industry of the town of East Hampton on Long Island, 
and I have a question uh, concerning the uh, determination of the uh, spawning stock biomass uh, threshold. Um, in the early 80s, I was fishing three pound traps uh, off the east end of Long Island, and there was the most amazing and colossal run of a uh, weak fish year class. And year after year, the fish would appear. I mean, we're talking about really huge catches, like uh, two tons per pound trap overnight. And um, year after year, they'd get larger, 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 until finally, I forget the exact year, we were catching 16, 17 pound weak fish. And, you know, it was uh, utterly amazing. They, we were still catching a couple of tons per pound trap overnight when the run was going on. And um, the next year, poof, nothing. What was left of the year class had died off. Obviously, 17 pounds is about the end of their life cycle. So my question is, when you determine the uh, threshold for the spawning stock biomass, are you looking at a year class like that to determine? Because that year class was so incredibly exceptional that if we see it once every 50 years, it would be, uh, you know, amazing. No, when we look at the, when we sort of project what, say, 30% of female, of SSB under average natural mortality would be, we're using average recruitment. So that includes the, there's the potential for high year classes and the potential for low year classes. So it's not based on sort of the best case recruitment scenario. It's based on average, a distribution of average recruitment. Uh, yeah, thanks. Oh, thank you for the uh, excellent presentation, Aaron, and thanks for all the questions. Now we'll move on to number five, and I'll get back to Tom on management response to stock assessment update. And Tom, will you proceed again? Yeah, as I said before, I was the one that made the motion years ago to basically stay at one fish and a 100-pound bycatch so we can get some fisheries data, keep going even if the stock's that low. I, I still think it's really important, but I'm trying to get the advice of the technical committee. Does it make really any difference if we basically eliminate the one fish and the 100-pound bycatch because the numbers are so small? I'm not sure, and I'm asking for your opinion. We haven't, we haven't done any projections with this model under different scenarios, so, um, so we can't say right now. I think if the, if the board is interested in looking at that, um, we could certainly look at that. Um, harvest is very low, it's a small component of the total mortality, so I don't think it's going to save anything, but we could look at sort of what would be your expected or unexpected gains from that kind of an approach if the board is interested in looking at that. As Tom pointed out, the uh, management since, what is it, since 2009, we've been at the one fish uh, possession limit recreationally and the 100 pound commercial limit. Uh, so anybody else from the board have any uh, thoughts on changing management at all? I mean, obviously we don't have to do anything, but it's just if there are any ideas. And looking around, I see none, so we'll move on to the, what's that? Oh, I'm sorry, Chris. I didn't see your hand there. Uh, thanks. No, no interest in changing. I think, uh, unfortunately, there's not much more we can do. And uh, you know, if if the uh, fishery, the stock does come back, uh, seem to get the impression that it might be the recreational and commercial fisheries that uh, pick up on that signal first. So uh, at least the uh, you know the the incidental catch that's allowed right now may allow us to uh, the fishermen to, to see that to where we can. Uh, maybe get a better handle on on what the stock is doing. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Roy? Just to focus in a little bit on the question you asked, John, 
I was wondering if uh, Aaron or Katie have an opinion. It, it's my perception that uh, young of year indices have remained relatively status quo with, with some annual fluctuations, at least in the Delaware estuary, an, an important component of the spawning uh, nursery ground po population. Um, assuming that the young of year indices have remained status quo, the fish seem to reach one year of age and then disappear. What does that suggest to us? Do, does that help us focus in on any potential management um, direction? Thank you. Bottlenose dolphin harvest. Um, I, I would just say that that's, that's the importance of um, moving forward with this ecological monitoring so that we have potentially a better handle on, on what is happening there. Um, and also the age, even if, you know, if, if there's good recruitment, you see um, good year class strength, um, even at age one fish, even though the fish are maturing at, at age one, um, compared to, you know, age two and age three fish, they're much, much less fecund. So they're still, even at age one, they're not contributing like a, a two or three year old weak fish would be. So, um, but I think potentially getting a handle on some of those more complex ecological models would, would give us some insight to what's happening there. Thank you. Uh, and I was just joking about the dolphins. Uh, Lynn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do not want to be on that board. Um, <laughs> Just back to the bycatch issue and the in the observer coverage. So a question would be, you know, that's a recommendation of the assessment is to really increase that coverage, particularly south of Hatteras. Who can you give some idea of what would be the process? Who would be the people who could potentially develop a, an effective design for that and some estimate of cost? We've actually had some success in um, the ACCSP. So basically, NEFOP has a great design. Um, and further south, I think, you know, extending that further south would be, would be great, and that's where the cost would be. I know North Carolina has done some of their own um, bycatch monitoring, although I think that's primarily inshore um, versus offshore, but that's still valuable information. So I think, you, you know, do we want to have funnel money to North Carolina um, or to some of the other southern states to in, enhance that monitoring? There is a Southeast Fisheries Observer Program on shrimp trawls, but the samples are very limited in the South Atlantic compared to the Gulf of Mexico. And again, the, the Northeast program has great design. All of those have a great design. It's just a matter of let's increase the sample size in the existing programs that we have. And ACCSP did funnel some money to do that in the Mid-Atlantic region for a few years, and we did get better discard um, numbers for some of our species, including weak fish, but that's not really a long-term monitoring program. Tony, did you have something you wanted to add? It was to that, that point that I think it is an important recommendation. We are, at least I have been hearing anecdotally from some fishermen that they are starting to see weak fish and what can we do about it. And you know, from my discussions with Katie and Mike, our only way to really address that issue is to get increased sampling so we can get a true handle on what is going on in those discards instead of just seeing more, you know, right now it's a little bit more noise. And so we can't give a definitive answer. Um, and so without having that increase, we're still going to not be able to answer those questions to the industry. So I think it is something important for the board to consider. Thanks. Uh, do we have any other comments on Matt? Oh, Chris. Yeah, th uh, thanks again. Uh, just to the point of uh, ob observer <laughs> coverage south of Cape Hatteras, uh, Katie's right, all of our uh, state observer program work is uh, in estuarine waters. However, I think the Northeast is, uh, observer program does go south of Hatteras in North Carolina. Um, I know uh, I know the observer teams uh, from the uh, from the Northeast have come down to talk to us in Beaufort, for instance, and checking some of the the places where people fish. I don't know how far beyond they 
how far down they go. Um, but I think there is uh, a little bit of observer coverage from NEFOP, at least through North Carolina. Uh, so that stuff's there. Um, but, you know, again, how much coverage relative to how much effort is probably still a question. Thanks. Thanks. And seeing no more comments, we're going to move on to the next uh, topic, which is consider approval of the 2019 Fishery Management Plan Review and State Compliance Reports. And Mike has a presentation to go with that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So the Weak Fish Plan Review Team um, met earlier uh, this month to conduct the 2019 FMP review, and I will go through that now. Uh, first, looking at the status of the fishery in terms of the, of the landings, um, one thing to note throughout this presentation is that the recreational data being presented is uh, the, new, uh, the newly calibrated FES data, um, so that, that's already been incorporated here. Um, harvest, uh, as total harvest peaked in the 1980s, but has been on a pretty significant decline since then. In 2018, the total harvest was about 228,000 pounds, a uh, 62% decline from 2017, and the lowest combined harvest in the time series. The commercial fishery comprised 45% of that total at 102,000 pounds. Um, this is the lowest commercial harvest on record and it came primarily from North Carolina, New York, and Virginia. The recreational fishery was 55% of the, of the total poundage, uh, and that was at 126,000 pounds. This was the lowest recreational harvest on record, and that came primarily from North Carolina, New Jersey, and South Carolina. Looking at the recreational sector specifically, uh, the harvest in terms of numbers of fish was uh, about 90,000 fish. That was also the lowest on record. Uh, the recreational releases increased in the 1990s, but they have declined since then, and they've been low and without really strong trend over the last 10 years. Uh, recreational releases in 2018 were about 861,000 fish. This is the lowest number of releases since the coastwide bag limit uh, went into effect. And these releases were primarily from North Carolina, Virginia, and New York. Recreational average weights historically have trended towards larger fish to the north. Uh, in 2018, uh, there was a little bit of an interesting trend where the, this, this remained true with larger fish to the north than to the south, um, but we saw for several of the northern states, they had smaller weak fish than usual, and several of the southern states had larger weak fish than usual. Addendum 1 to Amendment 4 uh, lists out the biological sampling requirements for, le for weak fish. States are required to collect six lengths for every uh, commercial metric ton and three ages for every total metric ton. Um, there were three states uh, that, that the PRT noted um, in 2018 that did not meet the requirements. Um, New York, this was the third consecutive year that they had not met their sampling requirement. Uh, New Jersey and North Carolina, this was their first year in recent history. One thing that the PRT does note related to the requirements as they're spelled out um, in this year's review is that the MRIP transition did occur in 2018, which likely would have happened after uh, many of the states made their sampling plans. Um, this increased the number of age samples that were required of the states. And so from the plan review team uh, perspective, um, we, weren't, we weren't ready to recommend any of these states out of compliance with that kind of that shifting, uh, that moving of the goalposts, so to speak. Um, with the MRIP transition, but we just did want to note that uh, moving forward that states should, um, should begin to plan their sampling around the newly calibrated MRIP numbers. Um, overall, the, the PRT recognizes the difficulty in attaining samples uh, with the low harvests of weak fish, um, but we would recommend that uh, New York in particular, since they have uh, missed, the, missed their requirements uh, for the last three years to evaluate whether increased efforts uh, could increase their number of weak fish samples. Again, we don't note it as a cause of concern that we would recommend for any type of compliance issue, but, um, but it is, is something that we noted. 
Um, finally, related to biological sampling, and I'll, I'll bring this up in our final recommendations a little bit later, uh, but noting the MRIP transition and the increase to the requirements, something that the board may want to consider is whether the age requirement, which is based off of the total landings, um, whether the age requirement of three ages per metric ton is still an attainable goal in light of the increase in uh, in the in the recreational estimates. In 2010, uh, the recreational and commercial management measures of Addendum 4 replaced management triggers from Addendum 2. Um, but since then, the PRT has continued to evaluate the, the previous management triggers as they provide some perspective on a year-to-year -year basis on the magnitude of, uh, of landings. The first, uh, the first of these triggers uh, dictated that the commercial management measures were to be reevaluated if the coastwide commercial landings exceeded 80% of the mean landings from 2000 through 2004. Uh, which were about 3 million pounds. This trigger uh, obviously was not met uh, with about 100,000 pounds of commercial harvest in 2018. Secondly, commercial and recreational management measures uh, were to be reevaluated if any single state's landings exceeded its five year mean, its previous five year mean, by more than 25% in any single year. The only state uh, for which this occurred was Florida in 2018, and given the small magnitude of Florida's landings and them being a de minimis state, the plan review team does not consider this increase to be a cause for concern. Here we see a summary of the uh, management for weak fish. Uh, right now, weak fish are being managed under Amendment 4 with four associated addenda, the most recent of which instituted the one fish bag limit for the recreational sector and the 100 pound uh, trip limit for the commercial sector, as well as establish the, uh, the reference points that are uh, being applied today. And uh, one thing to note related to the stock assessment update is that uh, these reference points are able to accommodate the, uh, the reference points spelled out in addendum four are able to accommodate the numerical changes that are done in the assessment update as these are uh, relative reference points uh, uh, related to a percentage rather than a specific number. Um, Noting the status of the stock, uh, the last benchmark was conducted in 2016, and you just heard everything about the uh, 2019 stock assessment update uh, with uh, stock being depleted and total mortality still being above, uh, ab above the threshold value. Amendment 4 permits states to request de minimis status, uh, which exempts them from the biological sampling requirements. And they get this status if for the last two years, uh, their combined average commercial and recreational landings by weight constitute less than 1% of the coastwide commercial and recreational landings for the same two year period. Uh, we received requests for this status from Maine, Connecticut, excuse me, not Maine, Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Florida. Um, all of these states meet the criteria and are recommended for de minimis status. Uh, the PRT found that all states were in compliance with the terms of Amendment 4 and uh, the associated addenda and uh, would recommend that uh, states be found as such. We also had uh, a few other recommendations that are listed in the, in the FMP review report, um, and I'll go through a few of those here. Um, the consideration of using the, the biological reference points from the update, that is already accomplished um, as, as those, uh, those reference points are, are related to percentages rather than the actual numbers. Um, secondly, considering updating uh, the management triggers as, uh, established in Addendum 2 to Amendment 4, right now the plan review team uh, is just looking to the board for some direction related to those Addendum 2 triggers. Um, right now, there's nothing in place for weak fish that would uh, trigger management or, or initiate any type of changes or look at the fishery on a year-to-year -year basis. Um, so the, the PRT is just looking to the board to see if, if those triggers should be reported on in the same way and used just for informational purposes. Uh, should we stop reporting on this information 
Um, in the current form, it doesn't seem very useful as the, the triggered management actions uh, would occur at increased harvest levels that are not likely to be hit. Um, and from the, from the state perspective, there could be triggers related to numerically small annual fluctuations. Um, or the board could consider uh, tasking the, the TC with coming up with new, more useful triggers for this fishery. Um, another recommendation that we had was, consider, was for the board to consider updating age sampling requirements to reflect the MRIP data update. And this is something that is really a, a question to, to the states of whether, uh, whether the three age per total metric ton of harvest is an attainable um, sampling requirement. One of the examples where it really came into play this year had to do with uh, North Carolina. Uh, if North Carolina were evaluated under a requirement based on the telephone survey, they would have met their requirement. Um, that, that, sur that survey would have required 142 ages. They collected 170, but with the MRIP update, uh, that requirement changed to 192. So that gives an idea of the magnitude of change in the sampling requirements there. Um, and there's a question of whether that's still a reasonable goal or not. Um, and finally, the PRT would recommend that the board approve the 2019 Weak Fish FMP review, state compliance reports, and de minimis status for Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Florida. And with that, I can take uh, any questions. Thanks, Mike. Would it take an addendum to change those management triggers and the, the age sampling requirements? Yes, it would take an addendum for either of those. Okay, thanks. Uh, are there any questions for Mike from the board? Joe? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I think I just want to stay along those lines. Uh, so if that's the case, would we be looking for a motion then to, um, I guess, get a, a, a planned development team working on that first? And then my other question is in reference to the, the first, is that also something that has to happen through an addendum or can that be done by motion the, the, consider the use of the biological reference points? So the, the first recommendation was something before I got a little bit more clarification on how that worked, but the, the reference points of the update are assumed into place because they are using the same methods that were spelled out in addendum four. Thanks. Any other questions for Mike on the plan review? Uh, does anybody have any suggestions about updating the management triggers, updating the uh, age sampling requirements? Eric? Uh, it, it's, you know, Rhode, Rhode Island met its requirement, but that was a real struggle. You know, if we have to do more, I, I don't know if we're going to make it. I, I honestly don't know. Um, you know, if you're going to start taking samples from the recreational fishery because of MRIP data, if that's the intent, um, you know, that's so opportunistic you're going to fail miserably there. I just as soon see it stay the way it is and just hopefully the states that are a little bit short will pick up the game because there's just no fish there to do it. Thanks, Eric. Um, just from what you've said and what Joe said, is the consensus to uh, leave things alone, or do we, should we actually make these changes just to stay in compliance, have an addendum that actually reflects the, the new reality of what the uh, sampling is? Because what we need to do is, um, of course, to accept the, uh, the FMP review for 2019, but we could also uh, plan to move ahead on an addendum to address those sampling issues if the board so desires, correct, Mike? Okay, that's affirmative. So, uh, Tom? The recreational person that basically uses supplied 90% of our samples on weak fish passed away a couple of years ago and we really haven't found anybody that just directly basically does that to produce the samples. With the low stock numbers that we have and the low participation by any recreation, so it's really an exceptional catch to get a weak fish. 
and that people are not really aware of that we need samples, so the recreational sector is not bringing them in like they used to do. And the commercial sector, I don't know, it's up to Joe whether you get, but I don't think we can increase the numbers right now. You know, I really have a, have a difficulty. We had a difficulty when we had the high numbers, so I think we should leave it as it is. Uh, Mike's going to clarify some points. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So the what, what we're recommending is not to increase the requirement. Right now, what, what happened is the MRIP numbers increased, and the number of samples that need to be collected are based on the MRIP numbers. So because the MRIP numbers increase, the number of samples increases as well. So what kind of the question that was being asked is if, you know, and if the board wants something that's more of a, the way that it's been going rather than moving with MRIP towards that, you know, because of that increase, then the board would need to make a decision to reduce the sampling requirement to something, to a level that was more proportional to what it has been, um, if that makes sense. It's Maureen and then Joe. Thank you. Uh, under the current uh, requirements, it's very difficult for New York to meet its to meet the numbers of samples that we're supposed to collect at this time. Uh, just because the MRIP numbers, MRIP has shown that the numbers have gone up and that the number of samples has to go up correspondingly is not going to change the amount of weak fish we're actually finding that we're able to sample. And so I would recommend that uh, we not, that we have to reduce the number of samples we have to take based on the, M the new MRIP, MRIP numbers. Did I get that out right? Thanks, Maureen. Uh, Joe? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I, I'm not that, all that worried about characterizing the harvest <laughs> anymore. I, I, I think the two things that we're being asked here, uh, I don't think either of them are appropriate anymore, so I would like to see an addendum put in place that would um, kind of decouple us from the management triggers in addendum two, and also to have either the PDT or the, the technical committee look at some level of representing the age classes, and I think, I think samples from fishery independent should also count towards that collection, but just something that I, I, I wouldn't want us to lose the ability to still model by each individual age. I think, you know, the sampling that is in place right now for the catch at some level is probably enough, um, although I don't, uh, to, to characterize the catch for a catch at age, but I don't, I don't think that is nearly as important right now. It's just the ability to track age classes in this fishery. Mike, you have a response for that? So related to the management triggers, if it's the will of the board that, that you all don't find the, the exercise of bringing up you know, the addendum two triggers useful, then that's simply tell the PRT don't include that in the FMP review anymore, um, and that's and and we can do that. Um, as far as the the biological sampling requirements, that would that would require an addendum, and it also would require probably some work of balance, you know, communication with the TC, balancing assessment needs versus the state's ability to meet the assessment needs from a sampling point of view. Thank you, Mike. Well, it's sounding to me, and I don't know if everybody's getting the same impression, that we need a motion, A, to accept the FMP review, but also probably to uh, uh, ask that a uh, plan development team be formed to develop a new addendum to address these issues, because it seems like one way or the other we're going to have to go in that direction. So can we get a motion for the FMP review? Tom. So move. I'll move that we accept the basic report. We probably have some language there, yes. Do I need to read that? Good, my eyes are blurry today. Move to approve the 2019 Weak Fish FMP review, state compliance reports, and the de minimis status for Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Florida. Thanks. Do we have a second? Doug Hamans. Is there any objection to this motion? Seeing none, the motion is 
accepted and approved. Um, we can we have can we have a motion to uh, proceed? Oh, Tony, you have. Before I just perhaps a step forward would be to ask the technical committee to provide information to the board on or technical committee slash stock assessment committee on what is necessary for sampling for the assessment um, what kind of information do they need and how does that differ from what are the requirements in the plan right now and then let the board evaluate that and then we could consider starting an, um, an addendum but First, let's let you guys know what's on the table. So for what you're saying, we don't need a motion for that. We're just, okay, just and is that the consensus of the board that that's the direction we should go in then, is to task the TC and the Stock Assessment Committee to let the board know what is needed um, in terms of the data to produce the, the next assessment. Okay, well, that's simpler than proceeding with an addendum, great. Oh, uh, we have a question from Lynn Fegg. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just need to get some clarity, and I may have fallen asleep, so I apologize. If, so the, um, the management trigger issue is separate from the sampling issue, and that's, Mike, what you were saying. The board, if the board, um, we have a choice. We can either get new triggers, develop via an addendum, or we can just say, you know what, let's not report those anymore. Let's leave them as they are. I'm just trying to get a sense of where we're going with the trigger part of this. The triggers are, have been reported on from what I could tell since before my time with the commission and I've just kind of continued that with the plan review team, them reporting that information to the board, but it is for informational purposes only at this point because the addendum four measures when the commercial 100 pound limit and the one fish recreational limit went into place, those <coughs> replaced the, those management triggers. Um, so yeah, that was more for informational purposes and the, the impression that I have from the board today is that uh, those don't need to be included in the FMP review anymore. Okay, any further discussion of this topic? Seeing none, we are going to move on to the next one, which is to elect a vice chair, and I believe Mr. Woodward has a nominee. I do. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would uh, nominate Doug Hamlin to serve as vice chair of the Wheat Fish Management Board. Okay. Do we have a second? Uh, Justin Davis. And so we have a nominee we, that has been seconded, and I'm sure there are no other nominees. And Doug, you are elected. You'd like to make a statement? <laughs> I'm just glad that I gave the ladies at the front table one chance to get my name right before the motion came up, so. Thanks, Doug. Uh, at this point now, we are going to move on to other business, and Chris Pat Savage has an issue to bring up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, just wanted to update the board on um, uh, some work that uh, our staff has done looking at uh, commercial discards uh, in North Carolina. Uh, we again received more reports of weak fish discards from the Ocean Gillnet fleet uh, this past winter. I think this is the fourth year in a row of reports. Uh, but the reports of discard events occurred over a longer period of time uh, th this past winter. So uh, our staff uh, analyzed the Northeast Observer Program uh, data. And, and state landings data from, from this fishery since 2009 and found a considerable increase in trips discarding weak fish in excess of the 100 pound trip limit and a number of trips landing the 100 pound trip limit. Uh, the average catches of weak fish were considerably higher in 2019 compared to earlier years. Uh, however, more time is needed to determine if this is a consistent trend so it was so, since it was so much different than uh, what we've seen in, uh, in previous years. Uh, our staff plans on looking at this data annually to see if this trend continues. Uh, so this is just an update to the board and uh, maybe a suggestion that, uh, that other states might want to look uh, at the uh, Federal Observer data off their coast to monitor trends in weak fish catches, especially if uh, reports of increased catches increase from the commercial fisheries up there. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. And didn't uh, North Carolina and Virginia both look at this issue? Uh, a couple of years ago and at that time as you said there was not seen to be any uh, noticeable increase 
Yeah, the, the reports were coming from North Carolina and Virginia at the same time, and the, uh, the TC was tasked with looking at trends in discards and catches along the entire coast and didn't really pick up any trends other than I think the last year or two that the number of trips landing 100 pounds of weak fish uh, increased in Virginia and North Carolina. Uh, we, we decided to just look at the North Carolina Ocean Gillnet Fleet to see if there's you know, just a higher availability there compared to other parts of the coast since weak fish tend to be more abundant in North Carolina and elsewhere in the last 10, 15 years. And, and as I said, you know, we, we did see a, a, a considerable increase, but we're going to need to monitor this a little more closely to see if this continues. And I'll keep, you po keep the board posted on, on any uh, updates. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. Anybody have any questions for Chris? Seeing none, that concludes our other business, in which case all we have left is to adjourn and see no objections to adjourning. We are now adjourned. Thank you. Great. Before everyone runs off, we're going to start the business session at 345, so about a half an hour early. And if you know folks that are planning on attending that that aren't here, if you could uh, round them up, that would be wonderful. So 345. Thank you.